On this week's episode of Ride the Lightning, the Tesla unofficial podcast, more Cybertruck nuggets of information roll in as the official launch nears, from the configuration of the pedals to the size of the dual motor version's battery pack. Plus, the Cyber Quad for Kids is back, the DeLorean designer gives his blessing to the Cybertruck, and more. What's happening, friends? I'm Ryan McCaffrey, joining you for episode 433 of Ride the Lightning, your weekly Tesla unofficial podcast. This one for November 19th, 2023. And to start off this week, a quick programming note. I will be away for Thanksgiving with my family next week, but the show must go on, as it always does, as it has every single Sunday since August of 2015. So I've prepared a brand new show for you, totally brand new content. I've just recorded it ahead of time. So look for that next week at the usual time, Sunday, 9 a.m. Eastern, 6 a.m. Pacific. I hope you will enjoy that. And I do want to say in advance, thank you very much for allowing me to duck away for a little break with my family. And the good news, when I get back, It is the Cybertruck launch event. That will be the full focus of episode 435. And I am so, so grateful to say I will be there. Invitations went out this past week. And while I did not receive my own invite, my friend Andy Sly, check out his YouTube channel. He does a lot of tech stuff and a lot of Tesla stuff as well. S-L-Y-E, if you just search Andy Sly. Search that up when you get a chance. Check out his channel. Andy very graciously reached out, unprompted, I might add. I didn't didn't butter him up or anything. He just reached out and very kindly invited me as his plus one. So I am super excited. I am glad that I booked the refundable flight and hotel. I'm glad I will not have to refund those, or at least the plan is. I don't want to tempt fate here. The plan is to not refund those. The plan is to go... And I've heard from a couple of you as well who not only said that you got an invite, but also offered me your plus one. So thank you very, very much to those of you who reached out with that generous offer. And I hope to meet all of you there that uh, that did get an invite to this thing. Now, speaking of the delivery event, teslanorth.com is reporting that Tesla designer Javier Verdura who occasionally posts on Twitter slash X. I've interacted with him here and there. He mentioned the number of Cybertrucks that will be delivered at that November 30th event. He was speaking at a keynote in Monterey, Mexico, part of the Jorge Garza Inspara chair. And uh, this is Tesla North's right up here. They say, Verdura projected that electric vehicles will surpass internal combustion engine cars in sales and production by 2026. Side note, I sure hope he's right. 2026 is right around the corner. He based his forecast on current trends showing a rapid increase in EV production and a decline in gasoline vehicles. Verdura concluded with a significant announcement. The much-anticipated Tesla Cybertruck is set to hit the market on November 30th with the first 10 deliveries scheduled. It's unclear if these will be employee or customer vehicles. Well, I do have to be honest here. My first reaction to reading this was only 10. And the reason that I think I had that reaction is because there were about 25 or so, give or take, at each of Tesla's last two launch events. The Model 3 launch event in 2017 and the Plaid S launch event in 2021. The Model Y did not get a proper launch event And the Tesla Semi, well, quite frankly, I'm just not going to count that because that's not a a, a passenger vehicle. Although, I guess if we did, it would goose the numbers, goose the average up. Because what, did Pepsi got like 30-something vehicles, 30-something Tesla Semis that night? But anyway, Javier says it's 10, so that will be the expectation that that we have set here for November 30th, which certainly calls into question, all right, well, how many are they going to do the rest of the year? That was meaning 
the month of December. That was the Patreon poll topic this week. This week's Patreon poll topic was the last chance to get our final pricing predictions locked in for both the dual and tri-motor performance Cybertruck variants. So I thought the easiest way to do this was to simply put up two Patreon polls, one for each version. Now, the winning poll, the winning response in the dual motor poll with 33% of the vote was 60 to 64,999. 60,000 to just under there, 65,000. 26% each flanked that. So 26% voted 55,000 to 55,999. And 26% voted 65,000 to 69,999. On the tri motor performance vote, 31% 31% voted 85,000 to 89,999, 25% voting 80 to 84,999, with just basically the same 24% rather than 25, 24% voting 75,000 to 79,999. Well, uh, I there's a reason that I made that poll, or those polls plural the subject this week because the subject of my lightning round bonus mini episode this week recorded for those ludicrous tier backers and higher on Patreon was my final pricing and specifications predictions for the Cybertruck. So if you are very kindly and generously backing me at that $10 per month tier or higher, you can head on over to patreon.com slash Tesla podcast and listen to that lightning round episode that I recorded this week. It is the 72nd one. There's 72 of those now. So if you've been thinking about backing me on Patreon, you've been listening for a while, week after week, you enjoy the podcast. There are now 72 of those waiting for you if you are uh, feeling like you want to pledge at that $10 per month tier or higher. To do that, again, go to patreon.com slash Podcast. You can also get a seven-day free trial to that tier specifically if you want to go sign up for that and just try it out. And if you want to do the annual pledge rather than the monthly pledge, just pledge once for a year of support, if you do that, you will get a 10% discount. So thanks to all of you who are currently backing me on Patreon and those of you who are kindly considering it. Let's keep moving this week. Here's another tiny... Cybertruck tidbit for you. I teased this in the opener. The accelerator pedal in the Cybertruck is floor mounted. So if you're thinking, well, wait a minute, what? What do you mean? Just, it, you gotta picture it like a school bus. You know, the, the pedals in our vehicles now are in a pedal box. They're, they're hanging down from a pedal box. But like a school bus or a semi-truck, the Cybertruck has the accelerator pedal mounted to the floor and you simply press it down from to the floor. It pivots off the floor. So I, I don't really have any commentary on this. I'm sure Tesla has a good reason for it. Maybe it's to better accommodate the higher seating position of the Cybertruck relative to the other vehicles. But that's what they're doing. And... I thought you would want to know because I found it to just be an interesting tidbit. And let me give credit here. The picture confirming this came from Twitter user S.E. Robinson Jr. So thank you very much for that. Good, sir. Here's a slightly juicier Cybertruck bit of information for you. A little birdie who would know, I'll, I'll phrase it that way, told me the size of the dual motor Cybertruck's battery pack this week. And if you're curious to know, it's 122 kilowatt hours. So yes, I am reporting this as of recording. I have not seen this anywhere else. We'll see if any of the Tesla blogs pick it up. Nobody picked up my Cybertrucks will be on display at the busiest Tesla stores bit of news from last week. But hey, what are you going to do? I guess all of you listening get the mini scoops on this stuff and you'll know before everybody else knows. But Anyway, 
This is obviously a very clear 22% larger than the 99 kilowatt hour battery pack in the Model S and the Model X. And we're expecting roughly the same range ballpark as the Long Range X, which gets 348 miles. At least I am. I'll phrase it that way. I am expecting right around 325 to 350 miles for the dual motor Cybertruck. So, knowing that the Cybertruck weighs roughly a thousand pounds more than the Model X, you could probably take a guess as to what it would take to get to 500 miles of range. What size battery pack? Now, I went to journalism school and got a journalism degree. Therefore, math was never really my strong suit. But if indeed the tri-motor is going to be 500 miles of range, as was predicted or as was laid out, not predicted, as was stated at the reveal event four years ago, you would need not quite 50% more battery pack than a 350 mile or so dual motor battery pack. So we could, again, I'm, I'm really being kind of vague here on purpose because this is, this is definitely not an exact science. We could be looking at a battery pack on the tri-motor performance that is perhaps 160 kilowatt hours to 175 kilowatt hours, somewhere in that vicinity. I will note, as, as you may have already be thinking to yourself, I am probably way off here because, again, we don't know the range on the tri-motor yet. It might not end up being 500 miles for one good reason or another, but... I can at least tell you for a fact, or at least a 90 plus percent fact, I have it on, again, very good authority, that the dual motor Cybertruck has a 122 kilowatt hour battery pack. For a little bit of context, by comparison, the Rivian R1T's large battery pack that, that gets that truck 352 miles of range, so similar, on a dual motor setup, so again, pretty apples to apples, is 135 kilowatt hours. And remember, the Rivian is smaller than the Cybertruck, but that being said, it would still not be a surprise that the Cybertruck would be more efficient than the Rivian to get similar range out of uh, a smaller battery pack and in a heavier vehicle because Tesla has always been and continues to be for now way ahead of everyone in the efficiency department. Nobody gets more out of a kilowatt hour than Tesla does. Next this week, the previously recalled Cyber Quad for Kids is back up for sale on shop.tesla.com. It's the same price that it was before, $1,900. And here's the product description from the online Tesla shop, which, as I made my notes, it hadn't sold out yet. Let me take a look here and see if it indeed has sold out by now. I'll, I'll see if I can find it here in a second. Uh, if I just search Cyber Quad there. Oh, let's see. Nothing's coming up as of yet. All right. Well, I'll find it later. But anyway, the description is be ready for any adventure. Our all-electric Cyber Quad for Kids four-wheel ride-on toy is inspired by our iconic Cybertruck design and features a full steel frame, cushioned seat, rear disc braking, and LED light bars. Powered by a lithium-ion battery with up to 15 miles of range and a 500-watt motor with a top speed of 10 miles per hour, Cyber Quad for Kids is suitable for drivers 9 to 12 years old. Oh, and I did finally pull up the page here. It is still available as of this writing. The first time it was posted, it did not last long at all. It sold out very, very quickly. So it's been available for sale for at least a couple of days here as of this recording. Hopefully that means Tesla has a greater quantity of stock for people here so it won't sell out quite as quickly. So uh, more details here. Tesla says that orders will begin shipping in late November, so just a couple weeks from now. And the shop page details the changes that were made after the recall. 
So they increase the age range for this from, uh, or up to nine to 12. They added a tire pressure warning label that instructs owners to maintain a tire pressure of 20 to 30 PSI. They revised a product warning label defining intended use as a youth ride-on toy only, and they removed a seat support spring. Now, if that's not enough, meaning if a cyber quad for kids is not enough, there's also a custom cyber quad for kids cover for the cyber quad for another $95 that's it's black and it's got the Tesla T logo on the front along with the cyber quad graffiti font logo as well. So, Hey, if you're already in for 1900 bucks, what's another 95? Uh, I'll tell you, just thinking back to my own childhood, my parents could, would not have been able to afford something like this for me when I was in that nine to 12 age range for this. But man, I would have died and gone to heaven over something like this being gifted to me. Some kids out there are going to have their jaws absolutely hit the floor when this thing is under the tree this holiday season. So if, if you're interested in purchasing this, I would recommend acting quickly because they, this will probably sell out sooner rather than later. All right. Another little appetizer for you. Yes, we're not even officially on to the proper news stories of the week. The referral bonus has been tweaked as we head into the back half of Tesla's very critical fourth quarter here as they're trying to hit 1.8 million vehicles produced for, I should say, wait, 1.8 million delivered for 2023. So the $250 discount has now been replaced with Six months of free unlimited supercharging on a Model 3 or Model Y, along with the three free months of FSD that was already being offered. But you do have to take delivery by December 31st to get those six months of free supercharging. Now, if you're wondering about the S and the X, the referral is just the three free months of FSD. No free supercharging, no $250 discount. And if I had to guess, I would say that on paper, $250 is probably kind of equivalent to six free months of unlimited supercharging. Maybe it's less. I mean, I realize that varies wildly depending on how often that you road trip or that you supercharge locally. Like for some people, six free months of unlimited supercharging might be effectively worthless. But for others, they might get an awesome value out of it. Now, furthermore, I'll add too, you can spend your loot box points that you get from referrals on a Model Y long range raffle drawing that isn't going to be open for too long, meaning that if you do enter it, you're probably going to have decent odds uh, of winning it at least compared to your typical raffle. So it costs 1,000 loot box points per entry into that Model Y long range raffle. And a reminder that you get 10,000 points for referring someone. So 10 entries if you were to stuff all, if spend all of your points into into that uh, Model Y raffle. Here are the full legal details from Tesla. They say, Model Y long range sweepstakes official rules open from October 13th to January 5th, 2024 to legal residents of the U.S., excluding residents of New York, Florida, and Rhode Island. Well, that's a bummer. Who, as of October 13th, one, are existing Tesla customers, and two, have reached the age of majority in their jurisdiction of residence. I guess that means they're you're old enough to win a raffle in whatever state, I guess the must be different ages, maybe 18 here, 21 there. Uh, one prize available to be won consisting of one Tesla Model Y long range, approximate retail value, $50,130. Select vehicle configurations and features will be available. Odds of winning depend on the number of eligible entries received. So since this opened back on October 30th, I want to extend an apology to all of you listening 
because I seemingly missed this. Well, not seemingly, I, I clearly did miss this if it's been open for a month already since, uh, you know, that's, I don't know how the heck this slipped by me, but it did, so I, I do apologize to you. But anyway, I'll tell you, if you don't see anything else that you like in the loot box that you'd like to spend those loot box points on, heck, why not try and win yourself another Tesla? Especially when, as I say, I, I think your odds here are, relatively speaking, pretty darn good. Next this week, Tesla is maybe looking to head off potential Cybertruck scalpers out there, head them off, I should say, at the pass, with a clause in the motor vehicle purchase agreement. Now, before I read this, I want to add that uh, this has this was removed this week. It was put up and then it was taken away. But just keep that in the back of your mind. I'm going to go through this anyway because I do still think that this is going to apply. And I'll explain why in a moment. So the actual legalese in the motor vehicle purchasing agreement, which by the way, this was discovered in the Model 3 and Model Y purchasing agreement. There's a paragraph in there that says, for Cybertruck only, you understand and acknowledge that the Cybertruck will first be released in limited quantity. You agree that you will not sell or otherwise attempt to sell the vehicle within the first year following your vehicle's delivery date. Not with span, not pardon me, notwithstanding the foregoing, if you must sell the vehicle within the first year following its delivery date for any unforeseen reason, and Tesla agrees that your reason warrants an exception to its no reseller policy, you agree to notify Tesla in writing and give Tesla reasonable time to purchase the vehicle from you at its sole discretion and at the purchase price listed on your final price sheet, less 25 cents per mile driven, reasonable wear and tear, and the cost to repair the vehicle to Tesla's used vehicle cosmetic and mechanical standards. If Tesla declines to purchase your vehicle, you may then resell your vehicle to a third party only after receiving written consent from Tesla. You agree that in the event you breach this provision or Tesla has reasonable belief that you are about to breach this provision, Tesla may seek injunctive relief to prevent the transfer of title of the vehicle or demand liquidated damages from you in the amount of $50,000 or the value received as consideration for the sale or transfer whichever is greater. Tesla may also refuse to sell you any future vehicles. So, all right, that's the end of the legalese. There were a lot of strong reactions to this across the board this week, and I completely 100% understand why. For some, this is a corporation dictating what you can and can't do with your personal property, and those people are vehemently against this policy. For others, they would happily pay whatever the free market dictates, even if that's twice the MSRP, in order to acquire a Cybertruck as quickly as possible. And for still others, they don't want to see scalpers take advantage of an early spot in line by explicitly seeking to profit off of it. And I'm not saying anybody's right or wrong. I am acknowledging that a lot of people have a really good leg to stand on here in terms of why they would either be for or against this policy. For Tesla, this is seemingly explicitly about keeping scalpers from selling these things for exorbitant prices while they're still relatively relatively rare, which we all know they're going to be pretty rare for the first year or so, maybe six months if production goes well. But there's going to be a, a reasonable sized window where the Cybertruck is pretty rare. Because if scalpers do get to go hog wild here and drive prices up on a gray market, it's bad for the brand. Again, this is from, I'm, I'm talking here from what I believe would be Tesla's perspective. It's bad for Tesla. It's bad for their brand. It's a bad look for them if the headlines about the Cybertruck are all about Tesla's $150,000 truck and it was supposed to be 40000 
And to reiterate, Tesla isn't preventing you from selling the truck. They just want the first right of refusal before you do. I mean, I can't imagine that Tesla's going to give a blanket, no, you can't sell this to everybody who approaches them about selling it. Nor are they probably going to want to buy back every Cybertruck that people might want to part with. And again, there are lots of good reasons that someone might have for wanting to sell it. It might end up being too big for their life. Or heaven forbid, there's a job layoff or a medical issue in the family. Or if someone just wants to sell it at face value to a relative, as another example. So this policy, this this clause here, this is the first time that most of us, myself included, are being exposed to something like this, which is certainly more commonplace on low production, high-end cars. I'm talking supercars mostly. I mean, every Ferrari sold is subject to this. Uh, The most recent Ford GT incarnation has a very famous example of Ford suing a customer that sold their car in the first year. That customer was a guy that you may have heard of. His name is John Cena. It was settled out of court, if you're curious how that turned out. Now, personally, as long as Tesla doesn't stop people from selling cars to family members or even other members of the community at face value, at you know MSRP, no, no profit, no scalping, then I won't have a problem with this. And by the way, uh, on a related note, and speaking of low production, high-end supercars, If Tesla is going to institute this on the Cybertruck, and honestly, even if they end up not doing it, they are absolutely going to do the same thing on the next generation Roadster for the exact same reason. It's going to be a low volume supercar capable of doing zero to 60 in 1.1 seconds with the SpaceX cold gas thrusters installed. People who have crazy money who are into the supercar world will be willing to pay a big big premium on those cars. So I would fully expect this clause to be in the Roadster motor vehicle purchase agreement as well. But let's see how it goes with the Cybertrucks if in fact Tesla does go ahead with this policy. And that'll give us an idea of what to expect if they do from that first run of Roadsters down the line. So as I mentioned, this came from the Model 3 and Model Y purchase agreements and it had its own paragraph. And as I mentioned, it did get removed from there a few days after the internet originally found it and then it was the talk of the Tesla community. Some people have taken that to mean that Tesla will in fact not be implementing this policy on the Cybertruck. I personally think it's far more likely that they just didn't intend for this to get out yet, since quite frankly, there's no need for it to be on a Model 3 or Model Y purchase agreement, at least not now, not before the Cybertruck is out. And so I do think this clause will return exactly as I've just read it to you on the Cybertruck purchase agreements and then maybe back on the other vehicle purchase agreements once the Cybertruck is officially out the door. We will find out soon enough. Next this week, the designer of the first ever production stainless steel bodied car has given his blessing to the second ever production stainless steel bodied car. NPR spoke with Ital Design's Giorgetto Giugiaro. He's in his 80s now, but he is still designing cool stuff. And NPR got Giugiaro's opinion on the first stainless steel bodied vehicle since the one that he designed for John DeLorean over 40 years ago that I was so proud, so fortunate to own for 12 years myself. And Giajaro said of the Cybertruck, quote, when you step outside the norms, it's almost always seen as a provocation. It happens in all fields, from furniture to cooking, etc. Everyone wants to distinguish themselves. It's a market necessity and the Cybertruck will surely be successful. I'm sure of it. I'm convinced it will find its admirers. And he added later, 
I don't want to judge the Cybertruck as beautiful or ugly. It certainly has its admirers who want a vehicle to stand out, end quote. Well, obviously, as I not only owned it, was so lucky to own a DeLorean for 12 years, it was my dream car as a kid, I still have a poster of it, I'm looking at it right now, above, on the wall, above the, the microphone that I'm talking into right now. I'm a big fan of Giagiaro. He designed that car that just captivated me as a child when I saw Back to the Future. That car became my dream car that I was so lucky enough to eventually own. And so I, I got to figure that Giagiaro gets a kick out of the fact that someone is finally bringing back stainless steel to the exterior of a car. And maybe Giagiaro even gets a little bit of an extra kick out of the fact that it's Tesla, seeing as how the first volume produced car to use gullwing style doors since his DeLorean was also made by Tesla. That, of course, being the Model X. Uh, by the way, he's also totally right about people stepping outside the norm and that causing a big reaction from many other people. You know those fireside chats that they do at, at like TED Talks and other kind of conferency things? I just want to speak this into the world in the, in the perhaps event that it could come true someday. I would love to moderate a conversation, a fireside chat, if you will, between Giagiaro and Franz von Holzhausen. How do I make this happen? This is a new life goal. Not This would be so cool, and if I may say so humbly, I can't imagine anybody better but me to do that. That would be so much fun. Anyway, let me take a quick minute here to tell you once again about Accelerate Auto and their excellent X-Care extended warranty coverage available for your Tesla. As you know by now, Tesla themselves only offers a fixed two-year, 25,000-mile extended coverage plan for your car, and you have to buy it before your original factory warranty is up. The X-Care plan is far more flexible. It can go up to 10 more years and up to 125,000 more miles after your factory warranty is up. It also doesn't matter if you purchase the car new or not. It doesn't matter how you acquired it. You can still buy that X-Care coverage plan. And it offers everything that Tesla's extended care plan does. So it's got the rental reimbursement, the trip and interruption coverage, which Tesla doesn't, but it's got the $100 deductible and 24-7 roadside assistance that Tesla's also does. So it, it matches and beats Tesla's own uh, roadside, or pardon me, Tesla's own extended vehicle warranty option. And of course, as I've been mentioning more recently, Xcare now also offers the option, you don't have to do it, but the option of adding battery and drivetrain coverage to your policy. So if you're interested, you can get $100 off your purchase with the discount code LIGHTNING. And to take advantage of that, Go to accelerateauto.com slash xcare, which is x c e l e r a t e a u t o dot com slash x c a r e. That discount code again is lightning for one hundred dollars off your purchase. Sadly, not valid in Florida. It's a state law legal thing. Anyway, hopefully, most of you can take advantage of this. Thank you to Accelerate Auto for helping to make this podcast happen. All right. Back to the news this week, because there's plenty more. I realize this is hardly news at this point, but at least for me, and hopefully for you too, it's still fun to look at these numbers and see Tesla's incredible success. I'm going to go over some of that incredible success right now. The Model 3 and the Model Y are still dominating, and I emphasize that word dominating, the U.S. EV market. I saw this written up on Tesla Roddy who writes, according to vehicle registration data from Experian, the Tesla Model Y and Model 3 were the two most registered electric vehicles in the U.S. between January and September, dominating the rest of their competitors by a wide margin via Automotive News. In addition, EV registrations during the period have reached 7.4% of the overall market, compared to just 5.2%, 
during the same nine month period in 2022. The data also suggests that if the pace continues, 2023 could mark the first year that EV sales surpass 1 million in the US. So here we go. The top 10 EV registrations by brand for the first three quarters of the year, January through September, number one by a mile is Tesla with just under half a million registrations, 489,000 and change for a segment share, meaning the EV segment, 57.4%. Number two, Chevrolet, 50,000 and change on the registrations, 5.9% of the segment share. Ford at 46,000 plus, Hyundai at 40,000 plus, BMW 31,000 plus EVs, Rivian 30,000 plus, Mercedes-Benz 27,000 plus, Volkswagen 27,000 and one, Kia 23,000 plus, and number 10, Audi at 17,000 and change and 2% of the EV market share. How about by model? For again, the first three quarters of the year, January to September, the Model Y, number one, at almost 300,000 registrations, 293,000 and change, which is up 88% from last year. The Model 3, 165,000 plus, that is up 15%. Number three is the Chevy Bolt EUV. That's the slightly longer version, the you know, little, little more cargo room in there. 30,724. That vehicle is new for 2024, so it is 100% change from 2023, or excuse me, from 2022. The Ford Mustang Mach E, 27,000 plus, it's down ever so slightly, 1.8% from last year. The Volkswagen ID4, just behind the Mach E, 27,001, which was that's of every that was every single EV in the U.S. that uh, that Volkswagen had so, at least so far this year was an ID4 that is up 145 percent year over year for them. The Hyundai Ioniq 5, 24,000 plus, up 35 percent year over year for them. The, sh- the regular Chevy Bolt, 19,000 and change, up big, 214 percent, good for them. Of course, it had been not made from the whole fire battery recall thing. So, but good to see that the the Chevy Bolt come back. Number eight is the Model X, 19,025 registrations through the first three quarters of the year here in the United States. That is down 19% year over year. And the BMW i4 at number nine, 17,599. That's up huge because I think it was barely out. There may have been just a couple of them at this this window last year. And number 10, the Rivian R1S at 16,000 and change, up 4,126%. So I guess there must have only been a couple of R1Ss uh, at, during this window in 2022. So to use one of Elon Musk's favorite phrases... Tesla has sold just shy of an order of magnitude more EVs in the U.S. than its competitors, or than the next closest competitor, I should say, so far this year. It is almost 10x. Although, if we had Elon here with me to sit down and talk with about this news story specifically, I'm going to guess that he probably wouldn't so much celebrate Tesla being far and away number one, but instead my guess is he would express disappointment that everyone else is so far behind. I mean, remember, this is a guy who back when the Model S unanimously won Motor Trends Car of the Year Award in 2012 said, and I'm paraphrasing, he said, I hope everyone copies us. Now, that guy, the Elon from 2012, would probably not be thrilled about how it's going for the industry as a whole with regard to the transition to EVs a decade later. Although, that Elon probably would be pretty pleased with how much Tesla has scaled up in that time. You know, I know this is a Tesla podcast, but I'd like to quickly give a shout out to Rivian 
at number six there on the EV registrations by brand. I certainly don't follow them anywhere near as closely as I do Tesla. But like Tesla, they're an EV startup run by very smart people who absolutely unquestionably hit their first attempt at a vehicle out of the park. The R1T and now the R1S are fantastic vehicles by any metric. Good luck finding really many, if any, bad things to say about them. And Rivian has navigated their own production hell, not to mention the supply chain nightmare that popped up for everybody at pretty much exactly the wrong time for them as they were trying to break into the market. So for them to be really on the up and up now is just awesome. They're number six on this list and they will hopefully climb higher next year because honestly, if you ask me, the world needs more Teslas and more Rivians. Now, as for that second list where it's broken down by model, holy cow, the Model Y is not only more than the eight non-Tesla vehicles on this list combined, you can almost also add the Model 3 in there too and still have the Model Y be more than the rest of the top 10 combined, but not quite. The Model 3 pushes the uh, two through 10 EVs of the, on this list about 50,000 past the Y. But you see the point here. It's just not even close. The Model Y is about, again, an order of magnitude ahead of the next closest non-Tesla EV. The Model 3 at number two is over 5X more than the number three car on the list, which is the Chevy Bolt EUV. Even if you combine the two Bolt variants, the regular Bolt and the EUV, the Model 3 is still three times more than those two combined, and the Model Y is about six times more than the two Bolts combined. What's kind of a shame here is that I don't think anyone else is going to narrow the gap on Tesla next year. Not in 2024. Not without dedicated battery factories, which have been talked about at other companies, but are not imminent for any of them, to the best of my knowledge. The S, X, 3, and Y, I mean, I think it's fair to say have all pretty much plateaued production-wise, but the Cybertruck is going to be ramping up throughout 2024, and that's going to add to Tesla's lead, probably at a pace ahead of what any of the other automakers are doing in this EV space, which if that were to prove true, I would actually find that a little sad because the Cybertruck is, air quotes, only going to be about 5,000 units per week or about 250,000 units per year once it's fully ramped up. Uh, one other somewhat surprising note on this list, the Model S isn't in the top 10. I would bet you, I would bet that it's number 11. Like, I'd be willing to bet an In-N-Out Burger lunch that it's just outside the top 10, but we don't have that data. But it's still surprising to me that it's not there when the X is at number eight with 19,025 registrations in the U.S. through the first three quarters of the year. That means the S is below 16,439 through three quarters of 2023. And that number, of course, being the number 10 entrance uh, registration number, which is the Rivian R1S. So I guess the Model 3 has just eaten into Model S sales fairly substantially, although given how much higher volume the Y is than the 3, I suppose it's probably true that the Y has eaten into more X sales than the 3 has eaten into S sales, well, if you were to compare them apples to apples. But still, bottom line, Tesla is crushing it, and their lead is likely to widen in 2024, in my humble opinion, which is good for Tesla, but bad for the EV movement in general. So, hey, other automakers, let's go. Let's see it. Let's crank it up. Let's get moving here. All right, I've still got, my goodness, I've still got three more news stories for you in a very, very busy week. 
Another company that's been in the fossil fuel business is about to get into the EV fuel business. Following BP's announcement last week that I talked about that it would buy $100 million worth of Tesla superchargers, the EG Group, a British retailer that operates gas stations and convenience stores across the UK and Europe, has announced a deal to purchase Tesla's supercharger hardware. This story comes via Drive Tesla Canada, who writes, Securing this best-in-class equipment from Tesla marks another milestone for EV Point and is hugely exciting for us. It is the first deal of its kind entered into by Tesla with a third-party charge point operator in Europe and will transform form how our customers charge their vehicles and how they interact with EG. Since installing our first EV charger back in 2012, we have continued to invest in the technology. This deal will accelerate the delivery of vital charging infrastructure for motorists to help power the transition to net zero, said Zuber Issa, CBE, the founder and co-CEO of EG Group. Well, the smart oil companies and gas station chains out there are going to do this. You're going to see more of this. The not-so-smart ones will just go out of business in the next few decades with their heads in the sand. So BP, or BP and now EG, I say, glad to see this. This is now, the, again, the second one of these stories in as many weeks. But hey, I'm going to get greedy. Let's get more of these stories. Let's hear about more companies buying Tesla superchargers and rolling them out around the world so that Tesla doesn't have to do all the work in that department themselves. Next up, GM has snatched a key Tesla gigacasting supplier. This was a Reuters exclusive, and it was sent to me by longtime loyal listener and longtime Patreon backer, Peter Chalet. So Peter, thank you. And it's Uh, The Reuters story reads, if you can't beat them, buy them. For years, a little-known company called Tooling and Equipment International, TEI, has helped Tesla push back the frontiers of gigacasting, the process it pioneered to cast large body parts for cars in one piece to save time and money. Until 2023, that is. TEI is now part of General Motors after agreeing to a deal that may have flown under the radar, but is a key part of the U.S. automaker's strategy to make up ground on Tesla, for people familiar with the transaction said. By snapping up a specialist in sand casting techniques that accelerated the development of Tesla's gigacasting molds and allowed it to cast more complex components, GM has jump-started its own push to make cars more cheaply and efficiently at a time when Tesla is racing to roll out a $25,000 EV, the people said. With TEI gone, Tesla is leaning more heavily on three other casting specialists it has used in Britain, Germany, and Japan to develop the huge molds needed for the millions of cheaper EVs it plans to make in the coming decade, the four people said. At the same time, Tesla is scrambling to find another sand casting specialist to fill the role TEI performed, or even develop such crucial expertise in-house to cut its reliance on outside suppliers, the people said. Well, stuff like this is bound to happen, right? It's business. And hey, good on GM for trying to fast forward their EV innovation. But but here's what's going to happen. Tesla's going to do what they've always done. They're going to figure out a better way to do it themselves, vertical integration style, which the Reuters report kind of hinted at there too. I mean, I can guarantee, I can almost guarantee, almost guarantee that Tesla was not blindsided by this acquisition by GM. I'm sure they had some kind of inkling or warning that this was coming. The key is, Now let's see what GM does with this acquisition. If it helps them lower the cost of their EVs that, by extension, allows them to remain more price competitive with Tesla in terms of the end price to the consumer, then that's a good thing for the EV movement. All right, finally this week, yes, it has been a long, long news block, but finally... 
an interesting little news item for you. Walter Isaacson's authorized biography on Elon Musk has been optioned as a major motion picture biopic by A24, with Darren Aronofsky attached to direct. Now, I wouldn't call myself a movie industry expert the way I am, or at least I hope to be in the Tesla space, and I've spent the last 20 years becoming an expert in the video game space, but I do know enough about the movie world to know that A24 is a very respected, highbrow movie studio that's known for making really high-quality stuff. And with Aronofsky on board, this could be a really good movie. In fact, Elon himself agrees. He responded to a post announcing the news of this biopic development on X slash Twitter by saying, quote, Glad Darren is doing it. He is one of the best. If you're not familiar with Darren Aronofsky, he really made his name with his first two movies, Pi and Requiem for a Dream, both of which I must confess I've always wanted to see, but I have yet to see. I have seen a couple of his other movies, though. The Wrestler with Mickey Rourke, which was excellent, and Black Swan, also excellent, with Natalie Portman. And he also directed The Whale last year, starring Brendan Fraser, which is another, another one I haven't seen, but is supposed to be absolutely outstanding. So my question to all of you is, got any Elon Musk casting ideas? Who should play Elon Musk? Email, tweet me, DM me on Instagram with your thoughts. I will be genuinely curious who's out there, actor-wise, and who would do a good job of playing Elon? All right, that is it. As I said, that's it in a very, very busy week of Tesla news. But stick with me. I'm going to take a short little musical interlude. Actually, it won't be musical. It'll be a little quick word from our friend Franz von Holzhausen. And after that, I will come back with a few of your phone calls in the Ride the Lightning hotline right after this. Hi, this is Franz von Holzhausen, and you're listening to Ride the Lightning with Ryan McCaffrey, the Tesla unofficial podcast. It is time to hear from you wonderful folks in the Ride the Lightning hotline, your chance to call in and be featured on this podcast. There are two easy ways that you can do that. Either use your smartphone's built-in voice recording software, record your question, please try to keep it to 90 seconds or less so that I can get to as many people each week as possible, and then email that file to me at teslapodcast at gmail.com. Or you can take that same 90 second or less question and just call in and leave a message on the Ride the Lightning hotline. It's that simple. The toll-free number that you can dial anytime, day or night, is 1-888-989-8752. Again, that's 1-888-989-TSLA. And if you know someone special with an upcoming birthday, anniversary, graduation, or some other special occasion, you can give them a unique gift of recorded voices from friends and family telling them why they are special. The recordings can be podcasted or put onto a keepsake. Visit lifeonrecord.com to learn more. First up is Brad from Minnesota. Hey, Ryan. How's it going? You know, two and a half years into my Model 3 ownership, I love autopilot, and I want to use it more. I want to use it more on rural roads, highways, not necessarily only on the interstate. But gosh darn it. Autopilot just has to follow the right line on the street, not the left line. The left line's straight. If it hugged the left line, I'd be good. But every time the right line veers out to a turning lane or a passing lane, just these wild turns back and forth to just cause me to have to pop it back out of autopilot so I can take control. I wish it wasn't that way. I wish autopilot would just hug the left line. Is that so difficult? Let me know what you think. Thanks a lot. Take care. Hey, Brad. Well, I hear you. This used to be a huge nitpick of mine, too, until Tesla switched the FSD beta folks over to the FSD stack on the highway. That has pretty well eliminated this problem, at least for me. Now, am I suggesting that you start subscribing to FSD in order to solve this? Certainly not, because you shouldn't have to. Everyone's autopilot should behave this way. But realistically, 
it's not likely to be resolved, I don't think, until if and when Tesla does decide to have one single stack for every single car, regardless of what software the person has or hasn't paid for. I do think they will do this eventually, and I'm even optimistic that they'll do it somewhat soon, since FSD, particularly on the highway, is in a pretty solid place now. But yeah, the good news and bad news is that the FSD beta stack seems to fix this. Cheers, Brad. Thanks for the call. Next is James from Brisbane, Australia. G'day, Ryan. It's James from Brisbane, Australia. Love the podcast, and it's part of my Monday commute to work ritual. I have a 2020 Model 3 Performance pre-pre-refresh, or OG Chrome as I'm calling it. A couple of months back, Tesla changed the recommended daily charge from 90% to 80%. I think you have the same variant from 2019, so you may have had 80% when you first got your car before the change to 90. I thought it might have come up on the podcast at some point, but unless I've missed it, it hasn't. So I'm keen to hear your thoughts and any insights as to why the change. Pats to the doggos. Bye for now. Hi, James. I've got a 2018 myself, but yes, you are otherwise correct. I dug into the owner's manual on this and couldn't find anything except for a note that LFP cars should charge to 100%. Honestly, I wouldn't worry too much about it. I mean, we have enough data on the Model 3's nickel-based battery packs now, with people putting actually literally hundreds of thousands of miles on single packs, and others doing a whole ton of supercharging, and all the data so far suggests that these batteries are pretty resilient. So drive it and enjoy it, my friend. Cheers. Thank you so much for the call. I've got time for one more call this week, and it will come from Robert in Texas. Hey, Ryan, it's Robert from Texas with just a quick comment on the FSD beta stack for the highway and also a request from Tesla. And I know sometimes when you put these software requests uh, on your show, they get done pretty quick. So first comment, I'm still loving the FSD highway beta stack. It's really amazing, really smooth. And uh, actually, it helped me avoid a crash where someone was in my blind spot, came over my lane, and it actually moved a little bit out of the way. So pretty impressive. Uh, the quick software thing, which we've mentioned before, but maybe if you mention it again, it'll get done, is under autopilot in the settings, minimal lane changes for current drive, that little button. Couldn't they add a button that says minimal lane changes for uh, all all drives so that we don't have to hit that button every time we get in the car and start the car up uh, and want minimal lame changes. So that would be a great little addition. It'll probably just take them a couple minutes. Thanks very much. Love your show. Bye. Always great to hear from you, Robert. Uh, while I and there are certainly plenty of others out there that would agree with you that it sure would be nice to have an option for that minimal lane changes on this drive to just be on by default all the time, Here's a shortcut, and I will apologize up front if this was a recent uh, pro tip of the week, because in my my head I'm thinking, I didn't I just play this? But anyway, here it is anyway. <laughs> just when you're driving uh, and you're on autopilot, just press to the right or left on your right scroll wheel when FSD beta is on, and it will bring up the menu in the lower left corner of your screen where you can then just tap minimal lane changes for this for this drive, uh, tap that button right there rather than having to dig into the menu. And then the only other catch is that you have to hit left or right on the scroll wheel again to set your profile back to average, if, if in fact your profile was at average, or just set it back to whatever it was. So there you go. And, and I would say, yes, I've been really impressed with the behavior of the FSD beta stack on the highway specifically. It's not perfect. But it's been very, very good overall in my personal experience. Thank you, Robert, and thank you to everybody that kindly took the time to call in. Feel free to keep those calls coming. I gave you the instructions for how to dial in at the top of this segment, so I will get back to your phone calls very, very soon. But for now, the show is not quite done. I'm going to take a quick little break, and when I come back, I will have your pro tip of the week and a bit more right after this. This is Steve Downs, the voice of Master Chief, Sierra 117. You're listening to Ride the Lightning, the Tesla unofficial podcast. You know, that Cybertruck looks a lot like a warthog, doesn't it? Master Chief, out. 
I want to start my spirit of adventure portion of the show by giving you an update on Daisy, Daisy the Boxer. I want to say thank you to the many of you who reached out asking about her, checking to see how she's doing. And the good news is, it's good news. It is just a urinary tract infection. It was a little, um, I wouldn't say scary, but it was a little unnerving for a minute because um, I got the urinalysis results the next day and everything was clean. There was no sign of infection there. So I was like, okay, well, I guess that still leaves the door open for this to be something potentially really bad. But there was a urine culture that was taken and allowed to culture for two or three days. And so another day or two later, I got the results from that. They called me and said, yep, it cultured into, it even had a, there was even a name for, for it. I forget the name of it now, but definitely infection, UTI, no problem. She's actually done with her antibiotic now. She'll have to go back uh, in a little while for a follow-up urinalysis to make sure that there's, you know, that the antibiotic got everything and, and did its job. But super big relief. And again, thank you to all of you who very kindly reached out to ask about her and, and express your well wishes to her. On a Tesla-related note, to, to go from, from grateful and heartwarming to a little annoyed and frustrated on a Tesla-related note here, it finally started really raining here. Like we haven't, our summers are dry and it doesn't typically rain until this time of year into the, into the winter. And so it uh, started finally raining here. I've been driving around in the rain the last couple of days. And I wanted to, to ask all of you, you don't have to email me or tweet me or anything, but just I'm just kind of floating this out there. Have the automatic windshield wipers on your Tesla gotten like laughably terrible? Just not just worse, but like comically worse in recent months. I guess it must be from some sort of software update tweak to the way that the cameras perceive the light or, or something. And I'm talking about not just when it's raining, by the way, but also when it's not. Up until it started raining, it's been driving me nuts because I'd be driving around in the middle of a clear, dry day and all of a sudden it would just start, the windshield wipers would start, which is embarrassing. Or even at night, Again, not a cloud in the sky, no no moisture on the windshield, and it just do a couple of swipes. And it's just like, come on, what are, what are we doing here? What's going on? So uh, it also, it really underperformed in the rain today on the automatic setting to the point where I had to override it and just had it have it manually on, which I know, f- hashtag first world problem. It's not the worst thing in the world. I've only, every other car I've ever had before this one I had to just manually set the wipers to be on and at the speed I wanted. But for an auto auto wiper setting, the Tesla auto wipers are currently not getting it done. It is, at least on my car. I don't know if this is happening to anybody else, but it's been kind of frustrating. And no, before anybody asks, there's nothing up on the top of the windshield where, you know, where the camera array is. There's nothing there. It's all clear there. So I'm not sure if I've got a hardware issue or... If it's if it's Tesla tweak something on the software side and it's just being really wonky now. But anyway, I'm going to give you an entertainment recommendation for this week. And it is a video game called Alan Wake 2. It's a survival horror game. So it's pretty much definitely not suitable for kids, certainly not young kids. But boy, is it a fantastic game. I'm still making my way through it. I'm about eight or so hours into it right now, but it is awesome. It got great reviews everywhere, including at IGN. And don't worry when you hear the two, Alan Wake 2, you don't need to have played the first one. It certainly helps if you did, which I did, but the story is told through a character in the game who didn't experience the events of the first game, which I think is a really smart way to approach it. So Alan Wake 2, if you need a good new video game for your either PC or Xbox series or PlayStation 5. Check it out. How about a pro tip of the week? Here's Jeff. Hey there, Ride the Lightning crew. Got a pro tip. Uh, This one's a little bit niche, but I think it's going to be a big deal uh, in the future. So I was lucky enough to just upgrade to the new iPhone 15 and the uh, the side button, the action button, switched out uh, the old volume on, volume off button. 
So when you set up the phone, you can pick a couple different options. You can leave it as a silent mode button. You can turn it into a flashlight. And I just kind of ignored it and then went back and realized that you could also make it a shortcut. Really didn't do anything with shortcuts before this, but I uh, thought about what if I turn it into a shortcut and make it open an app? And you can do that. So I made it open the, the standard Tesla app for my car. Uh, which means that when I need to get to the app, I can quickly just hold down that button for about a half a second. But even more important, when you get that that uh, lockout feeling where you got to go into the phone, either close out the app, reopen it just to get the car to recognize that you're standing right there when you're kind of locked out and your own sentry mode is recording you, you can you don't have to reach into your pocket. You can reach to your phone hit that button, hold it for about a half a second, and then the next thing you know, uh, it recognizes you, the app's open, and it'll close down a second later because it's still in your pocket and doesn't see any light. Um, also, That's been working really, really well for me, so give it a try. Let me know what you think. And now back to your host, Ryan. Thank you. This is a great tip, Jeff. Thank you. I mean, you're right. This one might be a bit niche for now, But over the next few years, as more folks upgrade to the iPhone 15, 16, 17, this is going to become more of a ubiquitous feature for folks. And setting it to open the Tesla app is a great and useful choice for Tesla owners. I appreciate you calling in with this one. And if anybody else out there has a good pro tip of the week that you'd like to share with me and your fellow Tesla owners and enthusiasts, please call in to the Ride the Lightning hotline. It's the same same way with that, which I told you about earlier in the podcast. Okay, before I go, I'll mention some friends of the podcast that can hopefully be of use to you sooner or later, starting with abstractocean.com. They've got a ton of great aftermarket Tesla accessories for all four Teslas, and probably soon, I'm sure they'll have Cybertruck accessories. They'll have all five production Teslas. But for now... S3, X, and Y, go check them out, abstractocean.com. Whether it's you want to get the tempered glass screen protector that's custom fit for your Tesla, whether you want to do the rear footwell lighting kit, maybe for your Model Y, have that, you know, class up that second row a little bit, uh, or and if any of a number of many other aftermarket accessories, go get it at abstractocean.com. Pile everything you like into your online shopping cart. And when you get to check out, use the coupon code RTL podcast, all one word, no spaces to get 15% off of your first order. The snap plate and snap plate plus are now available at everyamp.com. This is the front license plate bracket that is a nice, clean, minimalist design. It snaps on and off in seconds. It's paint safe, grill safe, radiator safe, and autopilot safe. It doesn't get in the way of anything. And when you want to remove it, whether you're going to be going to a cars and coffee, a car, you know, car show, or you just you're cleaning your car, or whatever it is, you don't want it on there, it will come off and leave no unsightly hardware behind. Make those fix it tickets go away with the snap plate or the stronger snap plate plus. There's a discount code for this now. Thank you to the snap plate folks. That code is RTL. So go to everyamp.com slash RTL and then use the coupon code RTL. Budgetsafesolar.com. Put them on your list if you're shopping for solar for your home or business. I had a great experience as I've told you. Uh, my system is is up and been up and rolling now. I'm, I'm getting close to a year. I'm about three quarters in. What is, yeah, February. So now this is, right, this is November. So I'm nine months in. Been happy with mine. Uh, Budget Safe Solar also now offers home battery storage as well, including the Tesla Powerwall. So check them out if you are shopping for solar. You're going to shop Tesla Solar. You're probably going to shop one or two others, as you should. I would. I did. But check out BudgetSafeSolar.com. Put them on your list. And if you do end up going with them, please use the referral code RTL. Immaculate Reflections. Awesomely talented professional detailer here in the greater San Francisco Bay Area. Their website is irdetailing.com. Any service that you book there, there will be a nice little Ride the Lightning listener discount for you. All you have to do is mention that you're a Ride the Lightning listener 
and that discount will be applied for you. So whether you want to do paint protection film on some or all of the car, you, whether you want to ceramic coat your car, whether you want to paint correct your car, or maybe all of the above, head on over to irdetailing.com, get in touch, and you will take your car over there, and I guarantee that you will leave very happy. PureTesla.com slash RTL is your one-stop shop for your dash cam and sentry mode setups. $49 free shipping anywhere in the U.S. will get you the 128 gigabyte kit. I highly recommend it. It is a micro SD based card uh, memory format, I should say, that will absolutely be reliable for you long term, which USB flash memory, not so much. They also have a 256 gigabyte version for $69, also free shipping anywhere in the U.S., comes fully formatted, take it right out of the package, plug it straight into your car, and you are ready to go. PureTesla.com slash RTL. Once again, my Patreon, I mentioned it at the top, we are into the the holiday, the gift-giving season, so uh, if indeed you have found this podcast to be of use all year long, my hope is that perhaps you will consider backing me on Patreon. The website to go to is patreon.com slash Tesla podcast. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N. The base level support tier is just five bucks a month. And in return for that, you will get early access to each week's episode. You can step up to that $10 a month tier and get not only the early access each week, but also that lightning round, that weekly bonus mini episode that I do on Patreon of which there are now 72 of them. So, and then the support tiers go up from there and all the perks and bonuses keep stacking as well. So I'd be humbled and grateful if at some point you will check out patreon.com slash Tesla podcast and consider a pledge. If you're not already following slash subscribing to this podcast on your favorite podcast service, it's totally free to do that on any of the big ones. May, uh, most of you will get it on Apple Podcasts. I'm also on Google Podcasts, TuneIn, Spotify, and YouTube Podcasts as well. And with YouTube specifically, you're going to want to search Ride the Lightning Tesla so that you find my channel with the rest. I guess that's still a safe search term. That's probably still a good idea of a search term for any of the rest of them as well. If you need a referral link, I talked earlier in the podcast about how there's now the six months of free unlimited supercharging along with the three free months of FSD. Uh, if you just need a referral link, my hope is that you've got a friend, family member, or coworker that can uh, give you theirs. But if you just need one, you need to take advantage of it, you need to get that bonus, you can use mine. Just type in into a browser ts.la slash Ryan73014. Finally, if you'd like to follow me on any of the social medias, I'm on two of them at least, Twitter slash X and Instagram. I have the same username on both, and that username is DMC underscore Ryan. You can email me anytime. The email address is teslapodcast at gmail.com. And with that, before I go, let me say hello and thank you to the Plaid, Maximum Plaid, and Roadster in Space to your backers. I'll start with the grandfathered in plaid level folks this week. A huge thanks goes out for their continued support to George Cassioppo, David Brander, Logan Willis, Peter Chalet, Eric Randolph, Dory and Steve Guberman, the Tesla owners of Taiwan, Ron Lee, Charlie Gillespie, David Perella, Dennis Peake, Jeff Angwin, Chase, Chase Cabanillas, pardon me, the Lydia family, Aaron Altschul, Jared Brown, Jerome Strack, Jamie Dalton, the Tesla Owners East Bay Club, Mike and Barbara from Louisville, David J. Howes, Matt Nixon, the Tesla Owners Club of Wisconsin, Ish, not Elon Musk, Peter, and the Bear Boys of Colorado. Next, a big thanks to the Maximum Plaid backers, Jonathan Wales, Cameron Clark, Daniel Grummer, Seth Capello, Nick and Tony, the Galpin family, Ryan from New York City, Darren Nickel, Kaz Barnes, Brett Libano, Patrick Wisneski, Gil Cabrera, Watley, Mark Eversole, Todd Badger, Joe Edgel, Kevin Yank, 
the Tesla Owners Club of San Joaquin Valley, Michael Williams, Will Stedman, Derek Nessel wrote, Justin Perez, Jeremy Harris, Chris Beach, Tom Mills, Corey O'Donnell, Aaron, John Cody, jo- uh, pardon me, Joel Sapp, Paul Casarino, Richard Corley, Chris Osborne, KB, Ken Epstein, Doug Carey, James Gregory, Adam Lavoy, Contact One Call Center.com, Jason Chalukas, Travis Krenzel, Bruce Otterstein, Tom Behan, Josh Pennington, Matt Kalen, John from Cream Ridge, New Jersey, Sean Tisdale, Dustin Hart, and Michael Gallo. Finally, an extra big thanks goes out to the Roadster in Space tier backers, Pete White, Lyle Austin, Steve Radspinner, Fernando Cordero, Lawton from Chicago, Sean Neidig, Neil Weaver, Jackson Wallace, Rolf and Jennifer Evers, Howard Anthony Smith, Victoria Aya Cavetto, Tesla Hitchhiker 42, Kara Weston, Robert from Near Philly, and Kristen Rumble. And that will bring us to the end of Ride the Lightning episode 433. A reminder, as I mentioned at the top, I will be away for Thanksgiving with my family. I have a brand new podcast prepped and ready to go for you. And uh, that is locked and loaded. So the Patreon backers at any tier, just that $5 and up tier, have uh, will get, let's call it ultra early access to that. You will get to hear it well in advance uh, because why not? It's done, it's ready to go, and you folks are very kind to back me on Patreon. So it's I'm happy to uh, to give you some extra early chance to listen to it before the Thanksgiving holiday here in the U.S. So, uh, big thanks goes out to all of you kindly backing me on Patreon. And a big happy Thanksgiving goes out to all of you who are celebrating that. I will, well, you'll hear me next week. I won't be here, but you'll hear me next week. And then, as I said, it is time for the Cybertruck launch event. Can't wait. It's going to be fun. But in the meantime... We've got Thanksgiving to look forward to, and we've got next week's podcast that I I hope you'll look forward to. I hope you'll enjoy it. All right. Happy electric motoring, my friends, and I will see you back here next week. I mean, I think a Tesla is the most fun thing you could possibly buy ever. That's what it's meant to be. Our goal is to make, it's, it's not exactly a car. It's actually a thing to maximize enjoyment. It's maximum fun.